So I'm very excited to introduce uh, Joanne. Uh, Joanne, I've never actually pronounced your last name out loud before. Ozug. Ozug. Joanne Ozug is here. Um, she's a food and lifestyle blogger, YouTube creator, very successful YouTube channel, um, and an on-camera personality. Her site is 15 Spatulas. Um, she makes uh, approachable recipes from scratch. Um, she's been featured in numerous media outlets, including the Today Show, Home and Family, The Cooking Channel, The Dr. Oz Show, Good Day, and more. She also has an adorable little boy named James, um, who's just a few months older than my own, so we compare notes all the time. Um, so welcome Joanne to the stage. She's gonna teach you guys about video. Thank you. Hi, good morning. All right. In my business, I am always asking myself, is this worth my time? For years, I've literally had a post-it note on my computer that says, why am I doing this? How does this action or thing serve me? Because we as bloggers have so many things we can focus on and we don't have time to do them all. I've been reading conversations lately online about so many people being put in Facebook jail banned from posting on their page for no apparent reason. And just last week, when the algorithm changes finally arrived to Facebook groups, limiting our reach there too, it was such a familiar feeling of that shoe dropping again, and then thinking, okay, now what's the new way to get around this? At some point, the time that we spend on social media caps out. And we reach a place where instead of investing time in ourselves, developing a skill, we're spending a lot of our limited time trying to manipulate our way around the newest algorithm changes that get thrown our way. I'm not saying that social media is worthless, but what I'm inviting you to do is to take a fresh look at the things you're doing and what the expected future payoff is from those things, and to consider the possibility of developing a new skill, getting in front of the camera. The ability to do public speaking well, to be in front of the camera, to be a host or a spokesperson, these are timeless skills, and one that I have found to pay really well. And it can not only add new income to your business, but also new kinds of opportunities. I know some people here came in already interested in jumping into on-camera work, and some I know are unsure. And my hope is that by the end of this session, you will know whether or not this is something you want to pursue and how to do it, both logistically and mentally. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about today. First, why do this work? Beyond the time and effort, it is challenging. I'm going to talk about why I think it's worth it. Two, we'll talk about getting started. We're going to go over how and where to pitch yourself. We're going to talk about how to come up with unique targeted segment ideas. We'll talk a little bit about hiring a publicist and also how products and cookbooks can change your journey. Number three, on-camera presence and media training. On-camera presence is so important because it's the product you're selling. And when people watch you on camera, their perception of you is so influenced by your body language, your facial expressions, and how comfortable you look. So we're gonna talk about hands, breathing, energy, and so on, and also about the mental work involved in becoming really comfortable and confident on camera. Number four, developing a character. Something I've realized with all things on camera, but especially with TV shows, is that you are acting. This doesn't mean that your on-camera presence isn't who you are or authentic, but you are amplifying select characteristics of your personality to a much higher level than what's normal in a day-to-day -day situation. Number five, how to and how not to plan for a segment. 
you always have a general idea of what you're going to talk about on a segment, but you don't know what the specific conversation will be because it's not scripted. So I'm going to talk about how you can plan certain parts of your segment in a way that aligns with the free flow nature of TV. The money breakdown and types of paid opportunities. The ability to do on-camera work is very financially rewarding, but it wasn't in the way that I always imagined. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by that, and we're going to go over types of paid opportunities, and I'm also going to go over compensation numbers for those projects. And then we'll finish up talking about fear. <sighs> a lot of people tell me that they get too nervous in front of the camera, and for that reason, they don't want to do it. I don't think fear alone is a good enough reason to not do this work if you're interested, because fear is so conquerable. And this is coming from someone who has had panic attacks during live TV. <laughs> but I sincerely feel that I've conquered that fear at this point. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that and also talk about how I got there. So let's jump in. Why do this work? I have three reasons why I think it's worth your time. The first is income and new opportunities. I started my food blog in 2010 and YouTube in 2011, and I noticed very quickly that on-camera work pays a lot more than writing, even with the same size audience for each platform. For my business, in the same given time period, a market offer that I signed for a sponsored blog post was $4,000 at the same time that a market offer for a sponsored video was 15. Video is more work, but they are higher revenue projects, and it opens you up to new kinds of opportunities, like hosting events and paid appearances. Number two, stand out with personality. As our field has gotten more and more crowded over the years, the question of how do you stand out has become more important. And I've always felt that the biggest thing that differentiates each and every one of us is our personality. Your personality is the easiest thing for people to connect to. It's memorable, and it's a huge part of why people follow us. Some people can exude personality really well via their writing. Like Examples for me would be Deb from Smitten Kitchen or David Leap from Leeds Culinaria. They, like, their writing is a personality explosion. Um, but personality-infused writing doesn't come naturally for a lot of people. Like, for me, it doesn't. And I think it's so much easier for your personality to come across on camera because it's a richer medium. And the last reason is demand. You are probably going to be asked to do more of this anyway, if not already. I was talking to a friend recently about how we've noticed more and more brand contracts, including some sort of media appearance. I have friends who haven't really done much video who are being asked to do on-camera ta on talent projects for brands. The demand is only going up. That's probably why you're here, right? <laughs> so those are the business reasons, but one more thing I want to mention is it's fun. Once you get past the fear, you might find that you really enjoy being on camera and these talent-centric opportunities. All right, let's talk about getting started. There are so many ways to do this, but the first thing I want to say is you can pitch from where you are now and book your own opportunities. You do not need an agent or a publicist to get into this work. The first thing that you do need is some linkable examples of you on camera as proof of performance. Otherwise, it'll be hard to book opportunities, whether it's you pitching or a publicist pitching. There is one exception to this that I know of, and that is if you write a cookbook. Typically, an in-house team at your publisher will book media appearances for you. Um, Christina talked a little bit about this yesterday with QVC. Um, and I know a few bloggers who've specifically written books to get more into TV. because so you don't have to have prior TV experience to get those segments. Um, if you watch the Today Show, you'll see like most of the segments center around books, product launches, and news. Like, media is very receptive to publishing. So an example of you on camera might be a recipe demo shared to your YouTube or your blog or even a Facebook Live. I think a Facebook Live, because it's unedited and in front of a live audience, is the best option. The reason why is because producers often say, <laughs> that a YouTube recipe demo alone is not a good enough example of being able to do media. The problem is you are controlling the camera, you're editing it, 
If you mess up, you can do it again. You're usually not interacting with someone else, and this is all the opposite of doing live TV, which is why you really want to get that first clip. So let's talk about how to pitch. Morning shows on your local TV station are a great place to start. Everyone here can get on local TV. So the first thing you want to do is identify the nature of the show. Watch a few clips, get a feel for the nature of that. Usually cooking on local TV is around like an upcoming holiday or time of year. Now, this is going to be different for like crafts or other things, but there's a lot of that too. All right, let's talk about crafting your idea. The first thing you want to do is offer more. A few years ago, one recipe for a three minute segment was enough. Now a lot of these stations want three recipes for three minutes. Um, an example of a uh, pitch idea that I did that was really popular was six different ways to make corn on the cob. It sounds like a lot, but it was just a bunch of different coatings and toppings, so it was really quick. And that idea got picked a lot when I was pitching. Next, you want to tailor your idea to the show. This is so important. Different ideas are suited to different shows. So let's go over some examples for pitch ideas. First is food holidays. These are great for local stations, and it's easy to come up with ideas around food holidays. That's six different ways to make corn on the cob idea I just mentioned. I came up with that after opening up the calendar and seeing there's a national corn on the cob day in a few weeks, and there's a day for everything. Like another example would be National Rotisserie Chicken Day. You could show different hacks for making 15-minute meals using a rotisserie chicken. People would love that, and producers especially. Next up, food trends. So when the unicorn-themed food was trendy, or is that raw cookie dough craze in New York City, you could pitch something like, here are three cookie doughs that you can make at home, so you don't have to make the trek out to New York City. Food news stories. There are always food studies coming out in the news. Um, so if something says, you know, people who eat kale every day live five years longer, you could pitch something like, here are three more ways to eat kale that aren't kale chips. Celebrity-inspired pitches. This is more geared to particular shows, but it's the one that I've been asked to do the most over the years. Um, one that I did was for Mother's Day. It was my favorite from scratch recipes inspired by celebrity moms. And then trend setting. You could have been the person who made tachos the new nachos. So these are just a few examples, and I want to acknowledge that these ideas can feel kind of contrived. But keep in mind that if you just say, hey, I want to make my chocolate chip cookies on your show, it's probably not going to be as well received as something really targeted and topical to the show. Next, you want to figure out how to make contact. So there are a few ways to do this. Uh, first thing you can do is call the station, ask for the name of the producer who's on the show, get their, their phone number or their email. This is almost never on the website, so don't waste time trying to dig that up. The other thing that you can do is you can submit to the assignment desk. So most stations will tell you, they'll have like a contact page. They'll tell you how to submit pitches. Um, my local station, for example, they give you a mailing address, a fax number, and an email address. And then someone's job is to sift through those pitches, throw most of them away, and pass the few good ones on to the producer. It's nice that the email is readily available, but you're sending your pitch to the gatekeeper instead of the decision maker, so that's why I've always preferred to call. All right, let's talk about crafting your pitch. You want to keep it very short and to the point. Here's an example. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm a food expert and full-time food blogger in Philly. National Corn in the Cob days in a few weeks. I would love to do a cooking demo sharing six different ways to make corn in the cob. Would you be interested? This would be pretty much the same, whether it's verbal on the phone or if it's written, but a written email should include links. See some people taking pictures. OK. <laughs> and then follow up. Get a response, whether it's a yes or a no. And if it's a no, pitch again a month later. Just because your idea doesn't resonate with them this time doesn't mean you should stop pitching new ones. Once you get your first clip, it is so much easier to get more segments, so be persistent. Let's talk about where to pitch. So once you've done traditional TV on a local level, you can move to national pitch shows like Today, Good Morning America, Rachel Ray, and so on. 
then Facebook Lives. When I was working with a publicist last year, many of the segments that I did were Facebook Lives. And this really surprised me. I had no idea how many outlets there are, but most major magazines and food publications are doing them. Um, I remember my publicist booked an appearance on Little Things, which I had not heard of, but um, I saw that they had 12 million followers on their Facebook page. So I was like, okay, this is probably worth my time. And I showed up to this big office building in New York City with sets and professional crews, a private green room for me, a professional makeup artist. And I was like, who knew? You don't get treatment like that at local news. And my publicist was saying that this is how the landscape is shifting. Don't just look to traditional TV anymore because Facebook and online media are just as big in many ways, and you get more time and typically a more targeted audience as well. In-person YouTube collaborations. Um, a lot of YouTubers are open to doing these. They're really encouraged by YouTube, the company. And what's nice is you're likely to find opportunities that are close to you since people live all over. Contests and game shows. If it's a good fit for you, you can check network websites for shows they're casting and consider applying. Doing these shows is great practice because you spend a lot of time on camera. It's fantastic for meeting producers and also opening doors to other things. A friend of mine, Hyla Johnson from Hyla Cooking, she did an episode of Chopped and she got invited to do Kelly Ripa's show and also do a local segment because they saw her on the show. That's really common to get follow on media like that. Something to consider is that some of these shows have a very specific agenda uh, you don't know what kind of edit you're going to get, and some of the challenges are kind of insane. Um, one contest that I did last year was the Home and Family Best Home Cook Contest that's on the Hallmark Channel. And I ended up as the runner-up, but it was an amazing experience. And while I was there, and in follow-up emails, the producer said that they would love to have me back on the show anytime, which is an amazing bonus on top of the experience to get that contact and that relationship with them. So. Contests are a mixed bag, but in my opinion and experience, there are some that are worth it. You just have, just have to decide like how adventurous you are, I guess. And then think outside the box. Where else? You could do an Instagram Live split screen with someone. Um, you could pitch to do a local, like a demo at a local food festival. Those are often taped and in front of a live audience. There are so many outlets to get experience on your resume. All right, let's talk for a minute about hiring a publicist. If you don't want to pitch yourself, you can hire a publicist who will do it for you. Uh, minimum commitments are usually between three and six months because they run on a retainer. Average rates are between three and 5,000 a month, and you are not guaranteed to get booked on shows. So I hired a publicist last year for three months because I wanted to, to do a lot of segments to get really comfortable with all types of live media, and I didn't want to do the work of pitching myself. Um, I did about one segment a week with her, and I truly did become really comfortable, so it was worth it in that sense. I did not do it for traffic. TV has terrible ROI <laughs> for time spent on that. But just know that this is an option. Um, it's not necessary, though, if, if you just rather pitch yourself. And if there are more questions on this, I'm happy to talk more about it at the end. All right, on-camera presence and media training. Viewers take cues from you and how to feel and perceive you when they're watching. So let's go over nine concepts that will help you improve your on-camera presence. Number one, above all, be present. If there is one thing you take away as what to focus on, it should be on being fully present with the host on your segment. What does that mean? Being present means you're not thinking about the camera, you're not thinking about any scripts that you've planned, you're not thinking about, I don't know, what to do next for your recipe, like that should already be automatic. You are primarily focused on your dynamic with the host. Being present helps you respond to unexpected questions and comments on the fly, both of which are guaranteed when you're doing TV. Being present also takes your focus off the cameras, which you shouldn't be paying attention to anyway. TV sets are jarring, the cameras are huge, there are a million lights, it's unnatural. 
being present and engrossed in your conversation with the host, with your food, whatever you're doing, helps take all of that away. I was talking to someone who does TV regularly and she said the key to not feeling nervous is pretending the cameras aren't there. Really think about that. The cameras are there to capture the experience. It doesn't help you to think about them. So just ignore them. So this brings me to number two, know where to look. So when you're, when you're on a segment by yourself, obviously you look at the camera. When you are on a, ho or on a segment with a host or someone else, always look at that person, not at the camera. Number three, know where to put your hands. I'm lucky I've got a clicker. I was like thinking like, okay, what are my hands? Um, so when it's your turn to talk, that's easy, right? Because you can gesture, you can do things with the food or your crafts or whatever. Where it's tough is when you're in listening mode, especially at the beginning of a segment where you're just like standing there waiting for your turn to talk. So if there's like a counter, especially if you're cooking or like a table, if you're crafting, that is the dream scenario. You can just put your hands on the counter apart like this. You can put them on top of each other. You can start working with the food. A lot of times there is no counter. Um, most of the time, like the most common surface that I've had to cook on is a fold out table. Tables suck because they're down here. You're supposed to be sitting. So in that case, you can clasp your hands in front of you like this. I actually prefer to get my arms behind me. Um, you can try, one, one I see a lot on TV is this like hands clasped across the stomach. If the table's high enough, you can try to get one hand on the table. Um, I worked with a media trainer last year and one thing that he suggested was that I have some default thing to hold, like a spatula. That didn't feel natural for me, but it's something you can try. The idea is to have something for your hands to do because typically it looks and feels uncomfortable if you just let them hang by your side. Or sometimes I see on TV like they get kind of just like stuck up here. <laughs> so watch TV to see what looks good to you, practice different poses, and adopt one as your default so you don't even have to think about it. Number four, don't forget to breathe. My media trainer always emphasized the importance of breathing. And at first I was like, how could it be that important? But it is. Watching my older videos back with him, I did not realize that for years I had a habit of not breathing, just talking, 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 for 30 seconds at a time. And when you don't breathe properly, and when you're nervous, add that on top of that, you literally have less oxygen in your body and reaching your brain. You will not think and process as coherently. So actually remind yourself to breathe. This is so important. Number five, avoid RBF. You guys know what this is, don't you? Resting bitch face. Okay, yeah. I was gonna pull a photo, but I didn't wanna be mean to whoever's photo I pulled. But so, basically the idea here is that, unfortunately, a fully resting human face tends to look bitchy, even if you're feeling neutral inside. So something that I've trained myself to do is just turn my lip up slightly like a sort of smile. You don't have to show, like show your teeth or anything, but just something subtle helps tremendously. And if you watch TV, you'll see that a lot of people have like a sort of smile going on all the time. Number six, have a plan for diverting energy. I find that the hardest part of a segment for sure is the beginning because you're just standing there waiting. You're not cooking or doing anything yet. Um, your energy is so high with no obvious place to go. Having a plan for getting the energy out is so helpful it was a total game changer for me. So before I figured out how to divert energy, the way that it manifested was in my cheeks. Um, for some people, it's trembling knees, shaking hands, it's all the same thing. So in one of my earliest segments, while I was being introduced, my cheeks started shaking, which had never happened before. I didn't know the cheeks could shake. <laughs> and out of reflex, my hands like just went up to my face, like, stop shaking. And then my brain was like, oh my God, you just touched your face on camera. That's gonna look so weird. And that was my first panic attack. 
And it was because I didn't know what to do with that energy, and I did not know it was coming. By the way, they were doing a close-up on the food, so it wasn't even on the clip. <laughs> yes! When I watched that clip, clip back, very lucky. But let's talk about some of the ways that you can get that energy out. So hopefully that never happens to you. So here are some of the nonverbal ways. If your feet are out of shot, wiggle your toes. This sounds so ridiculous, but it'll help you give movement in your body and also distract you. I was doing this all morning, just so you know. You, I'm wearing boots, so it doesn't matter. Number two, if it's natural in the moment, do something with the food or whatever you're working with. Um, sprinkle some cheese on your casserole. Toss the salad, even though it has been sufficiently tossed. It does not matter. You can also do things like use your face and like, like nod in agreement, like shake your head. Like this also helps just moving in some way. Let's talk about the verbal ways. These are more powerful for me, in my opinion, because you can really get some projection behind it. So, um, you want to look for chances to speak, laugh, gasp, etc., any way that you can make some noise. So the earliest opportunity is usually when they introduce you. So uh, they might be saying something like, we have Joanne Ozeg here from 15 Spatulas. And even though I know there's more coming after that, I'll still say something like, we have Joanne Ozeg here. Hi in a way that is acknowledging but not interrupting. I do this like in every segment, they always keep talking. And just like a, a little bit of a hi, like really helps my energy come down. Number two, jokes. If there are jokes, I will laugh heartily. This was an actual strategy when I was doing that home and family show and I was so nervous. I laughed really loud a lot. But this is actually a good thing because the producers are like, make some noise. Like they like noise and reaction. So it is a win-win. And number three, you can agree with people verbally, again, in ways that are acknowledging but not interrupting. So saying like, mm-hmm, or yeah, like whatever sounds natural for you. That did not sound natural. Um, number seven, be prepared for anything and stay cool. So one time I arrived at the station to shoot a segment, and I thought it was going to be inside on their kitchen set where they have an actual stove and everything. And when I showed up, they're like, actually, we want you to do this outside. We want you to use this grill, even though it wasn't a grilling recipe. And you're going to do it all on this fold-out table, my favorite. And I was using coconut oil in my recipe that I was planning to melt on the stove I no longer had. And even though I melted it in the microwave, like inside right before the segment started, of course it was completely hardened by the time we started because it was cold outside. This was one of my earlier segments and I didn't understand the reality that stuff like this actually happens all the time. And um, it completely threw me off. This was panic attack number two, by the way. Fortunately, there have only been two. Only two. Um, so before any segment, know that it will almost certainly not go exactly how you think it will. Things can change last minute. But you can totally roll with any situation that comes up. All you have to do is say, normally my coconut oil would be melted, but it's a little chilly out today, and carry on. Like, no one cares. Number eight, understand confidence. The confidence thing seems really obvious. Actually feeling it really takes intention. So I believe that confidence is a combination of two things, experience and owning the title of expert. So experience, I think, is the obvious one. Um, the more TV you do, the more confident you are that you can do more. Owning the title of expert. One of the most important things that my media trainer did for me was tell me, you are a food expert and you need to own that. That was uncomfortable for me. Like, How many people be like, I'm a food expert? Like, Really seriously, without wincing, not me. Um, but the thing about this is when you go on a TV show or like an on-camera project for a brand, like you, you do need to fully embrace that idea that you are the expert and you are the talent. If you're having a hard time wrapping your head around this, because I know for me, my objection was like, well, but there are other people in food who are better at this than me. 
A dramatic example would be Alton Brown. He knows more about food science than me. He has been doing TV a lot longer than me. He's really famous. But if you think about the people watching, the audience, you are the expert who knows how to cook or craft, like whatever. Embrace that. Number nine, study your videos. I do not like watching my videos back, but it is so important to do. You will learn so much about yourself, like that you twirl your hair or that you gesture wildly or mine. That is still my nemesis after eight years. Can you hear that? It's that like tongue click thing. You only pick up on these things watching yourself back. You must watch your videos back. Do it with your husband or I don't know, whatever. Like have some support, but you gotta do it. Let's talk about developing a character. If you look at any of the big Food Network celebrities and compare what they were like when they started and what their personality is like now, you will see clear as day that over time they develop and amplify their character. Developing your on-camera personality is so important because it helps you stand out and it also is more fun for you because your presence will be a lot richer and more playful. And you can do this with pretty much everyone. One of my favorites to look back on is Guy Fieri, looking at his old stuff. He's really amped it up, which is saying a lot for him. <laughs> All right, let's talking about developing your personality solo. So in terms of how to figure out your character, it should start with you. What do you like about yourself? What are your favorite characteristics? Bring those things out consciously. Let's talk about how to and how not to plan for a segment. One of my very first TV segments I did was on behalf of a brand. And the day before the taping, the PR company had me sit in a conference room for two hours, reading a 10 minute script aloud over and over again. It was really confusing because I thought, this segment is only gonna be three minutes. Like where? Where is the script from? Is this from the show? It was not from the show. The PR company had written it up as an example of how the segment might go. Let me tell you, nothing on that made up script was anywhere close in nature to how that actual segment went down. This was the cheek shaking panic attack moment that I mentioned from before. So, Practicing made up lines and getting like hung up on the things that I should say that like they weren't even relevant to the clip, it made my performance so much worse and more stressful than if I'd just been present with the host. Constructing an idea in your head about how a segment will go is trouble, don't do it. This is not preparing. So with that said, you can still plan some elements in advance. Here's what you should plan. The first thing is your elevator pitch. So even though the, the host will introduce you at the beginning of a segment, um, sometimes if there's leftover time at the end, they'll ask you more about who you are and what you do. So you want that down pat. You also want to know your recipe inside and out. This is so important for just feeling comfortable and at ease and feeling present. You don't want to be using brain processing, pre processing power trying to remember what's next. Then you want to plan a few short memorized talking points as possibilities to include. So have a few useful ones. So if you were doing um, food for women who just had a baby, you could say like, this recipe is perfect for taking to new moms because it freezes beautifully and it defrosts in five minutes in the microwave. Then you want some talking points that are personalized to your character or the segment theme. So um, I was watching a uh, Valentine's Day segment with Brandy Malloy on the Today Show. She's a food person. And she was making a seductive salted caramel chocolate tart. There was so much Valentine's Day themed wording, lots of talk of getting in the mood. And at one point in the middle of the segment, she said this tart was 50 shades of amazing. And I was like, okay, like that's a, that's a pre-planned talking point that, that you kind of threw in when the moment was right. But that's a good thing, because you want to have a few like talking points that are already memorized and thought out like in your arsenal and ready to use, 
but without an official plan on when you might say them, and maybe you don't even say them all, but you want like a few up in your bank. So you can have like witty ones, funny, shocking. This one was like supposed to be sexy. I don't, I don't know what Fifty Shades of Amazing is, but um, Fifty Shades, great. I don't know, but just have them already ready to use. Next thing you want is a cell phone photo of your setup. This is you know, relevant to food people, but sometimes you only have like five minutes to set up when you get to like your segment and a photo of like, this spoon needs to go with this bowl can be such a lifesaver in getting everything laid out quickly. And then you wanna plan out the things that you might have the host do. So hosts want to be involved. They, they don't wanna stand there either. They wanna be adding things, stirring things. So think ahead about what might be good things for the host to do and what you wanna do yourself. All right, the money breakdown and paid opportunities. TV segments are not paid. Um, you have to cover your travel usually. You usually have to buy your own ingredients. Some exceptions are like some of the national shows like Today and Home and Family. I don't recommend trying to get a regular like paid like cooking spot or something like that on local TV purely for income. Um, first of all, the station would probably not offer to pay for that, and I've heard of that happening to a few vloggers. Uh, but even still, budgets in local TV are not high. The average salary for a news anchor working full time is $43,000. So your three minute segment once a week is not gonna pay much. So what is the point then to doing these segments? The income potential comes from your ability to do TV, media appearances and all of that. And the people who pay for that ability are brands. So here are some examples of paid opportunities. First is a live TV segment on behalf of a brand. So you might do like a recipe demo for someone. Um, they pay you a set fee to work that segment and also you might share a few key messages. Talent-based video projects for brands. This is my favorite type of opportunity because you just do all the fun stuff on camera. A crew comes in to take care of filming, editing, all that stuff. An example of this would be, um, I did a project with Mediavine last year. They had a handful of influencers create recipes showcasing Samsung's latest kitchen appliances at the Bon Appetit test kitchen. So these types of video projects are in high demand and growing. Sponsored videos, these are the exact same as a sponsored blog post, just in video form shared on your YouTube or your blog. And then hosting events or competitions for brands. So some examples, um, I judged a contest for Trivia Natural Sweetener. They had a national baking contest. A friend of mine, Alicia from Mind Over Munch, she's a YouTuber. Um, she did like a hosting for the Voltaggio Brothers. They did something with like Barilla Pasta in New York City. These opportunities are so abundant. So I wanna talk some general compensation numbers for these projects. Fees are going to vary a lot depending on tons of factors, but I still want to give an idea. These are based on um, my experience, the norms from what my agent considered to be standard rates and also lots of talking with YouTube friends and other people who do this work. So a live TV segment on behalf of a brand should start at around 4,000 as the minimum. Talent-based video projects for brands, if you are just starting out and you don't really have a big audience, I'd say the minimum would be four. Um, something more market would be like eight to 10. Sponsored videos, um, I'm gonna just, yeah, okay, sponsored videos, that's fine. So sponsored videos, again, if you have like a small audience on your YouTube or your Facebook or wherever, start at around four. My consistent rate with about 10 to 15,000 minimum expected views on my YouTube channel, I know it's more for, for Facebook, um, my rate, which was paid consistently and hired out, was about eight or 9,000 per video. Um, and then hosting events for competitions, hosting events or competitions for brands, um, these should start at a minimum of about three. So several years ago, I did my first appearance and I had never done that before. I didn't have any friends who had really done that before. I had no idea what to charge. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna reach for the stars. I hope they don't hate me. $2,200. She didn't try to negotiate with me. She's like, okay. And now I know that that's the lower end and other people there had asked for more. So bottom line, if you are doing this work, aim high, charge a lot for it. 
I was kind of like shocked how much more I charge as compared to blog posts, but it really is warranted. You want to aim high. And the more experience you have, also raise that rate. Okay, our final topic. Let's finish up talking about fear. Overcoming fear is doable for everyone. I know it's a strong statement, but I really believe it's true. The first thing about fear is fear goes down as familiarity goes up. So of course, the more segments you do, fear will be less of an issue. When I was working with a publicist last year and doing one segment a week, it was unreal how comfortable it became. So that's great when you've got that experience, but what about when you're starting out? The thing you wanna do in that case is identify the root thought causing your fear. So um, the most common thought and the one that I struggled with when I started was feeling like I had to be perfect on my segment. So I could use that perfect segment to get another segment. And I had this fear that if I didn't do a good job, maybe I wouldn't be able to do that show again. Maybe somehow too it would prevent me from doing other shows. Oh no, crazy brain spiral, like you know how the brain works. And I was like, whoa, it is not that high stakes. Like thank you brain, but no. It, it's really not. Um, the little blunders that are part of being human, they can always be turned into a good thing. So please don't be afraid of screwing up. Just laugh and turn it into gold. So there was one show I want to mention that I did where I said I was making a no-bake cheesecake barfay. Instead of... <laughs> Like cheesecake. Did you just say barfay? <laughs> Instead of parfait. And earlier me, like when I was just starting TV, that would have derailed my whole segment. I would have freaked out. Fortunately, this is one of my like last segments. And I tell you, at the time, it truly did not phase me. I thought it was freaking hilarious. And the co-hosts and I were making jokes and laughing. It's real life. People love real moments. So please, do not be afraid of making these little mistakes. Do not let the fear hold you back in doing this work if you're interested in it. If you just get out there and do it and don't get caught up in perfection, fear will not be an obstacle for you. So thank you so much for listening to my session. I really enjoyed sharing this with you, and now I'd like to answer some scary questions. <laughs> oh, oh, you can go to the, uh, the mics here. <laughs> okay, so we were just talking about fear, and I mean, little mistakes are one thing, but what if you have a sneezing attack? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of funny. Like, is that like is a it? thing for you? <laughs> is that like a thing? I would be so afraid that I would just start sneezing or, you know, I used to get at school these laughing attacks and I just couldn't stop for 10 minutes straight. <laughs> so what do you do? Okay, well, if you're laughing for 10 minutes, you should probably pull that together. But the sneeze, because <laughs> then, you, then you've spent your whole segment doing that. Um, the sneezing thing, like I have a friend who like every time she sneezes, it's a minimum of four times. Like she, her body, okay, yeah, like her body is like not capable of sneezing less. And like, that's just kind of like a funny thing that we love about her. Like, I don't, I don't know, my opinion on that, like, that's just your thing and it's okay, it's human, it's, that's, I think that's funny. I'm so, like, you know, it's like nothing to be ashamed of and... Is it more like the fear that it might happen or like it actually It's more happens? like the fear that it might happen. Yeah, I mean, like usually what I think, um, what I ask myself is kind of those questions like what would happen, like if that, what if that actually did happen? Like what would that mean? And we make things seem like such a bigger deal than they really are. Um, and that's kind of like some of that um, personal work, you know, like just just being comfortable with like letting go of control and just things might happen, but it never matters as much as you think it does. Yeah, it probably does. And I know it's hard, you know, it just, but you do it anyway. It doesn't matter. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Joanne. Okay, question for you. So I got contacted 
almost want this higher. I got contacted by a news station last week. Um, it's actually a show in another state, okay. and they wanted me to Skype in, which I've never done before. And so it was interesting. They did the test feed about 45 minutes before, and it was sounding good. So we go live, and oh my gosh, it was so awkward. First of all, I don't know. I don't know if you've done Skype, but it's totally different. I like the interaction usually, and I just didn't feel it. It felt more cold and sterile. Yeah. So anyway, she's asking questions, and um, I was I was actually telling the number three, number two, number one of the best brownie mixes. And so she said, Melissa, what is the number one brownie mix? And I said, and I called her by name. I said, well, do you have any guesses? What do you think? And suddenly it was like crickets. And <laughs> she goes, well, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, oh, shoot, she can't hear me. And so it was super awkward. Mm. So in those situations, what do you do? Um, because then she kind of was quiet, and then she asked again the question, um, thinking I couldn't hear her. So what do you do when that happens? OK, well, first of all, S Skype is just awkward right? as a product. Um, yes, so yeah, yes. I feel you on that one. So she. Like, asked you a question, you responded, she didn't hear, and she asked you again? Yeah, I actually, she asked me a question, and then I asked her back to guess what she thought. And so, and she didn't hear me. And so, I, I still haven't watched the segment. Oh, it's on God. a show. I will not. And I actually had my husband, he was watching it the day I was packing. He was watching it, and I was like, turn it down, turn it down. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I was so, I was so embarrassed, but... Yeah, so the thing that I'm feeling on that, um, first of all, that sucks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 God, yeah, stupid TV. Um, the thing that comes to mind on that one is what I was saying about how people take cues from you and how to feel. And like one of the biggest jobs that I feel like that we do when we go on camera is pretending that we don't feel awkward. Like, it's so, it's so easy to be like, like, oh, I didn't hear you, like, oh my God, like, instead of just being like, what was that? Oh, like, oh, I asked you, or I don't know, like, just, just, like, it's, like, it's not anything, like, you, that's kind of like the acting thing, you have to pretend that, like, you don't feel awkward at all, like, this is going great, and just keeping that, um, that acting, kind of that facade up and make just... so you make it. Right? Yeah, exactly. So Perfect. hopefully that helps. I know. I just learned I will never do Skype again, though. <laughs> no more. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So say somebody contacts you to do a sponsored video. What kind of equipment do you use? Do you hire somebody to do the video? Do you hire somebody to edit it? And what was the other part? Uh, <laughs> oh, do brands, like oh, yeah, give you an allowance for that. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so the deal with sponsored videos typically is that they just give you a fee. Um, so if you're not going to produce it and make it yourself, you have to hire someone. That is a personal decision. Um, I started having a crew make my videos like, uh, partway through last year, but for, I don't know, like six years or something, I just did my own. Um, people thought I was insane, but what I did is I just had two cameras, just two DSLRs. I had one on a tripod just in front of me to get the wide, and then I had um, one kind of like off the side capture close up of the food. Did I just change? Oh, oh, is that someone else's? Um, and I just like went into my editing thing. I forgot what I used, uh, Final Cut Pro, and I just edited it myself. I did everything myself. Um, so that's kind of up to you and like what you want to learn. You can hire out if you want, if you don't want to do it, but you will be typically expected to pay for that yourself out of your own fee. So take that into consideration. And maybe like if you're not willing to do, to do it yourself, you could be like, I need to hire this out. Like you can kind of like justify your high rate a little bit, but like I got to pay these people to produce this, so you better give me this money. Nicer than that. <laughs> I just want you to know that my cheeks shake too. So it's oh amazing. man, amazing! <laughs> it's because we uh, smile so much. <laughs> uh, so two questions for you. One is you mentioned on camera coaching. Do you have any suggestions or resources where to find that 
service, I guess, for lack of a better word. I would think that maybe it's something you could find locally or online. So I'm curious kind of how you went about finding someone. Mm -hmm. And then also, second question kind of related to on-camera presence. Do you have any tips for keeping up energy level on camera? Because something I've noticed with like when I go back and watch videos of myself is I feel like I'm being really bright and animated. And then I look at camera, I, I watch the video later. I'm like, am I asleep? Was I asleep during this segment? Like, how is that working? Yeah. So I have to answer that one immediately. There's a producer who says that the camera adds like 10 pounds and subtracts 10% of your enthusiasm, although I think it's more than that. Um, that happens to me all the time. I think I'm really bringing it energy and I watch it back. I'm like, what? That? No, it wasn't like that. So that is just something that's cultivated by watching yourself back and figuring out the ridiculous amount of animation that you need to bring for you to look excited on your segment. And it really does feel ridiculous. And that's almost why I find solace in the idea that like I'm acting because it just feels so unnatural but that's how it has to be and that's okay. Um, your first question, so the media trainer that I worked with for instance, um, this is all in the booklets but like I put a few resources in there like one of the places, I, I lived in New York City until recently and there's a place called YouTube Space, there's one in LA as well, I think those are the only two in the US but I went to some workshops there. Um, if you're ever in the in those cities, it's really worth it to check it out. Um, and they had a class with a media trainer on like presenting and all, basically like a lot of the stuff I was talking about. Um, and so I ended up hiring him privately, just because I wanted like that one-on-one -on -one time with him. Um, and like his credentials were really good, and he was amazing. I probably shouldn't say how much I, it was hundreds of dollars an hour. It was really expensive, but it was so worth it. Um, like he was awesome. Uh, so I think you're in Wisconsin, right? You probably had to find someone locally and just see if they have some impressive credentials. Um, I think the thing about that, like, you know, I'd been doing this for so long and like the publicist, the media trainer, like I did that kind of last year and they were just kind of investments I wanted to make. I don't think that they're necessary. Like when you can do so much just by watching and tweaking and like that process, but it is also really nice to work with professionals too, so. Hopefully that answers that. I don't know. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Thank oh, yeah, sure. What would be a typical rate to charge for a satellite media tour? Okay, a typical rate to charge for a satellite media tour. I don't know what's involved in that. Um, or you're, you know, you go to one of those uh, places like you were talking about in New York City where they do your hair, your makeup, and you from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. do 35 interviews one after another with TV and radio. Okay, so that's for your book, right? No, it's for, for anything brand. Oh, okay. Yeah, it can be for book, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, as I understand it, like anything uh, like media related, like with books or whatever, is typically unpaid. But if it's something related to a brand, the brand needs to pay. Uh, and in that case, I'd probably do an hourly rate kind of deal. Um, so if it's like a few hundred dollars an hour or whatever, like what's your day rate or something like that. So do you want to describe that now or? I was just curious. Yeah. I did it recently and I wasn't quite sure Sorry. how much to charge, so. Right. I mean, like my example of the, um, Sorry, I know I'm like. Is it? You're fine. Okay, the uh, the media appearance I did, like the judging, for example, like I was like, okay, I'm gonna do three hundred dollars an hour. That's the one that she didn't even negotiate with me on. So, I'm inclined to say like at least start there and probably more. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Okay, can we get a round of applause for Joanne for that amazing Yay. talk? Thank you. Okay, Thank so, you much so much for doing that. <laughs>